Hi everyone, Timothy Ferris here with a few words about quantum field theory. A theory of such subtlety and profundity that some scientists have called it the greatest creation in the history of human thought. The physicist uh, Sidney Coleman uh, said the ascension of quantum field theory makes spectators gasp with awe and laugh with joy. Now, because this is physics and not, you know, postmodernism or spiritualism, the rise of a new theory does not mean that the people who were working with the previous theory or the contrary theory are drummed out of science or that anyone goes around saying, oh, our, all our profound ideas have been tossed in the ash can by this wonderful new development. No, quantum field theory and the alternative, which is generally called particle physics, uh, come to pretty much the same conclusions almost all the time. and. Um, the prospect isn't which one is right, they're both right, but which one provides a, a deeper view of nature. You know, the physicists have been at work for centuries now trying to figure out what the fundamentals of reality are like. And the claim for quantum field theory is that it gets a little more uh, profound, that it's a little deeper, that it gets us closer uh, to the uh, foundations of nature that are the uh, goal ultimately, of uh, quantum physics. Now, physicists, uh, like the rest of us, tend to talk about the quantum world in terms of particles because particles are what uh, experimenters work with. And they're real. We were taught in school, you know, that uh, matter is made of atoms, and an atom consists of a nucleus with a cloud of electrons around it. And um, each nuclear particle contains three quarks, and they're held together with gluons. And it's reasonable to ask, you know, how far down does this particle pyramid keep going? But field theory, quantum field theory, emphasizes the field from which the particles arise. The point of quantum field theory is that uh, if the fields are primary, and the particles are one of the ways in which a quantum field uh, reveals itself or expresses itself uh, to um, the scientists uh, doing experiments. Here at the observatory, uh, we take a long exposure, let's say, of a distant galaxy. And the light comes in, hits a bunch of little sensors on a CCD chip. And each of those sensors is a well, and what it holds are photons of light, which are particles of, of light. And uh, with each cycle that the camera goes through, it drains those wells and they fill up again a fraction of a second. With each of those events, uh, one is looking at particles, photons, which are the quanta of light. So in most experiments, you're dealing with particles. But if I consider, did this particular photon travel all the way from this remote galaxy to this chip? The answer is not exactly. It's kind of like if you're in a steam room at a spa and people come into the steam room, they're wearing a towel or nothing at all, but you don't assume from that that they arrived outside, got out of a cab, came into the spa dressed that way. You understand that they took their clothes off in order to come have a steam bath. And the situation with quanta is kind of like that. Those, those photons that collected here at the observatory are photons once they hit the chip, but before that they are quantum fields. What we call photons when we receive them are excitations in a quantum field, and those, it's those excitations that have been traveling through space and time uh, all that distance not the photons themselves. Now, field theory has um, been around since the 19th century, quantum field theory for about a century. And it's so important to physics that we all learn some of it in school. Perhaps you were shown magnets, you know, and how the, if we take the, uh, let's see, the, the same pole of each magnet and we try to push it together, uh, they, they don't want to do it, it resists. On the other hand, if we come around to the opposite poles, then they 
they lock right up. And all this happens even though we can't see the, the field. We have to intuit or induce that the field is there. Albert Einstein at age five, sick in bed, was presented with a compass by his uncle, something to distract the boy, and Einstein was obsessed with it um, because, as he recalled, the needle on the compass was responding to a magnetic field that encompassed the earth, as his uncle explained. But that field was invisible. Einstein went on to do work in uh, field theory and uh, wrote his general theory of relativity, his theory of gravitation, as a field theory, although it's not a quantum theory. And that's the big gap in quantum physics uh, nowadays is that uh, there is no quantum theory as yet that accounts for gravitation, which in Einsteinian terms is the shape and the behavior of space and time themselves. Quantum field theory envisions the entire universe suffused with fields uh, that uh, produce all the quantum particles. So there are quark fields and gluon fields and Higgs boson fields and electron fields. John Archibald Wheeler burst into the office of his thesis advisor at Princeton, if I remember the story correctly, saying, I, I found out, I realize why all electrons are identical, because they're all the same electron. They're all expressions of the same field. All quantum particles of a given kind are indistinguishable from one another, and quantum field theory explains why. Now one way to look at the conceptual difference between thinking of the quantum world in terms of particles and in terms of waves is the classic dual slit experiment that uh, you might be familiar with. Uh, the way you set it up is you, uh, you have uh, an electron gun, let's say, and you shoot electrons at a wall, and in the wall are two slits that you can cover up or not uh, as you see fit, and on the other side of the wall is a detector that will tell you which uh, electrons came through the slits and where they wound up. The electrons hit the detector and they, they make a spot. If you fire the electron at the wall and the slits are both closed, nothing happens on the detector, of course. If you open one slit and you fire the electrons, the detector starts to build up a kind of shadow of the slit where you can see all the impacts, so just as if you were to you know, shoot a BB gun at that, uh, at that slit. Same thing happens if you close it and you open the opposite slit, you get another shadow. The thing that makes it seem so paradoxical is what happens if you open both slits, because then the electron doesn't look like a BB, it turns into part of a wave. As you fire the electrons at the two open slits, what builds up on the detector is a series of alternating dark and light bands, which are interference patterns, and that's the signature of a wave. So which is it? A particle or a wave? The answer quantum field theory is that it's a field, and a field is capable of looking like a particle or a wave depending on how it interacts with its environment. The fields are basically most things in nature are looking to move to the most energy efficient state, to the lowest energy state available. So when you fired that electron, yeah it was an electron when you made it because you excited the electron field locally, makes it look like a particle, and you fired it at the wall. It's not really an electron in between the, there and the wall. It's just a perturbation in a field. The field comes to the wall, sees one slot, goes through the slot. That's the most efficient course. There are two of them, and there could be more. Not many students presented with this ever seem to have asked what would happen if you kept adding more and more slits. When it comes to the slits, there are more, more than one way through, so it becomes a wave, wave-like, instead of particle-like, but the quantum field is still the same thing. The way physicists tend to put this is that if you set up an experiment to make a position measurement, uh, the quantum field will look like a particle. If you set up the experiment to make a momentum measurement, the field will look more wave-like. It's how the experiment's set up, and because most experiments involving quantum physics have been set up as position, measurements. Anytime you put a detector anywhere, like the one on the telescope here, that's, a, that's asking the huge quantum field, what are, you, what are you like right here? And the answer will look like particles, like, like photons. And if you give it more options uh, than 
you'll get wave-like behavior. Now none of this has anything to do with the mental state of the observer. It's simply the setup of the apparatus. Quantum physics has not made science subjective. The whole point of science is to find objective facts which are independent, therefore, being objective, of the uh, opinions or point of view of the observer. Special relativity, as much discussed as if it said that everything is relative, actually uh, saves the objective nature of science and takes out the subjective nature uh, for observers uh, uh, involved in uh, high velocities. Now, quantum field theory, as deep as it is, uh, is not thought to be the ultimate foundation. There should be something way down there that accounts for the rules of quantum fields and why there are the number of them that there are and why some symmetries are preserved and some are, are broken. The nature of that account is, of course, still unknown, but it's possible that quantum computing will help owing to an extraordinary fact, and that is that a quantum computer with a given number of uh, what are called qubits, a given computational capacity, can replicate the behavior of any other quantum system with the same or a fewer number of qubits. Right now, quantum computers are fairly primitive, but if they can become practical and you can start getting, say, 100 qubits, 100,000, a million qubits, then it's going to be possible to simulate events way down on the scale of uh, time and space in extreme conditions such as the lip of a black hole that really are not possible to create in a laboratory and perhaps ultimately lay bare the foundations of reality. Well, anyhow, um, all of this may sound remote, but um, you and I talking and thinking about quantum fields is itself an interaction of quantum fields, so it's um, kind of more close to home than one might think. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Our recommended reading for this talk, Birgit Falkenberg's delightful philosophical study of quantum field theory, Particle Metaphysics, a critical account of subatomic reality, which looks at the history of why particle physics came to dominate thinking and is now giving way somewhat to quantum field theory thinking, Anthony Z's student-friendly textbook, Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell, and Steve Weinberg's magisterial and mathematically rigorous three-volume, The Quantum Theory of Fields, in which he details why, in his words, quantum field theory does such a good job of describing the real world.